verse 8, but with reference to the Son. God is your throne forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. Now, in other translations, like the King James, it says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom, or your kingdom is what thy means. Or the New International Version, but about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. So there's a difference there, isn't there? Is the Son addressed as God here, O thy throne, O God? Or is the author of Hebrews quoting the text to argue that God is the Son's throne? And if so, what does that mean? And the scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. We'll get to that part further in a moment. Well, let's talk first about this part. God is your throne forever and ever. It comes from the Psalms. He's quoting from Psalm 44 in the Septuagint or Psalm 45 in the Hebrew. Let's take a look. We'll come back to that. Psalm 45 in the Hebrew Okay, so he's talking about the king. You can clearly see from verse 2 forward. That is why God has blessed you to time indefinite. He says, I'm saying my works are concerning a king. May my tongue be the stylist of a st skilled copyist. You are indeed more handsome. Then the sons of men charm has been poured out upon your lips. That's why God has blessed you to time indefinite. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your dignity and your splendor, and in your splendor go on to success. Ride the cause of truth and humility and righteousness, and your right hand will instruct you in fear-inspiring things. Almost to our quoted text in Hebrews 1.8. We already looked at Hebrews 1.7, and then the background to it, right? The angels as spirits in public service to Jahuah. Now, what is this throne? Is the Son called God? And what about this scepter? Your arrows are sharp under. Your peoples keep falling in the heart of the enemies of the king. God is your throne to time indefinite, even forever. Scepter of your kingship is a scepter of uprightness. Verse 7, you loved righteousness and you hate wickedness. That is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of exaltation more than your partners. Okay, so the application here is clearly to a human king that is obviously representing Jah on the throne. So, as I mentioned in the pre-show discussion, it's sometimes easier when we talk about these texts and whether or not to translate it as, Thy throne, O God, it, taking God, Theos, Ha Theos really is what's in the text, well, most early texts, the best texts, as what they call evocative, a direct address, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Or is it talking about God being the throne of the one who's better than the angels, having been given a position in heaven at the right hand of God on his throne? Well, what about the translation aspect? So, you know, people often say that the, the, the most practical way. I mean, I've, I've heard it read in Murray J. Harris and others. It, sometimes it's the, 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 the best translation is with evocative. I don't see that at all. I don't see either Psalm 45 6 in the Hebrew or the Greek Septuagint or the quotation in Hebrews 1 8 as more likely being evocative. In the Greek text of Hebrews the quotation says, Ha thronasu, ha theos. So it uses clearly the nominative form. And sometimes the nominative can be used as evocative. But it can also just be used as a nominative. And so if we take a look at the text in Hebrews, if you look at some of the surrounding context, 
it talks about, for example, in 46.1, God is for us a refuge and strength. So if I pull up Psalm 46, 1, and we look at that, in the Greek it says, Hatheos hemon katafige kai dunamis. It doesn't use the verb esteem, is what I'm getting at. It follows the Hebrew text and often does where the verb is understood. So it's very similar to Psalm 45, 6, or 44, 6, in this case, in terms of the Greek. Right? There's no expressed verb if we look at the Greek. So the Greek of Psalm 45, 1, 46, 1 in the Hebrew. The Greek is Hateas Hemon Katafike Kai Dunamis. The God of us, refuge and strength. So again, it's it's similar if you look at Psalm, and let's do that now. We'll compare it with that fresh in our mind. Psalm 45, 6. If you look at the Greek, Psalm 44. Um, let's see. Psalm 44, 7. So, Hathronasu, Hatheos. There's no verb. The throne of you, the God. The God of us, Psalm 45, 1, Septuagint. The God of us, refuge and strength. To me, they look very similar in terms of the use of the nominative without an express verb. That's what I saw when I read the context and the surrounding usages of Theos. And I got the, um, the, the start of the next chapter. And I realized, you know, um, it's very similar. And I just didn't get the sense at all that hot Theos is used as evocative. I see it as either the subject, the same way that the NWT translates it, God is your throne. The nominative as the subject with your throne as the predicate and we'll get to what that means in a, in a minute and it's possible you could translate it as the predicate with the throne as the subject your throne is God but it would mean essentially the same thing I just don't think that comes out quite right or the emphasis is correct because the source of the royal authority under discussion is God right and it goes on to even say that explicitly in verse 7 of the Hebrew of, of verse Psalm 45 and the Greek of, of Psalm 44 and the Hebrew, verse 9, chapter 1. We'll get to it in just a second. Okay, so I just want to point out in the grammatical part of things, there's no reason at all. There's no real reason why we should feel compelled to see Hatheos in either the Septuagint of Psalm 44, 6, or Hebrews 1, 8 as evocative. It doesn't appear that way, obviously, to me at all. It appears more like the use of Hateas in Psalm 45 Septuagint, Psalm 45, 1, Psalm 46, 1, Hebrew. Our God, strength and power in Septuagint. That's how I see it. Okay, now, there's another part to this because let's just finish off the grammatical aspect because when we're talking about Hebrews 1 if we uh, let me just see here so and notice here so the notice here God is your throne and the scepter of your kingship and if you go to Hebrews 1 let's do that now go back to our subject text at least verse 8 we'll get to 9 in just a second we're moving right through here, trying to provide context as we go through it, because it's very important you understand the buildup and the, the sense of each you know, statement or quotation that's presented about the Son and what it means. So now, here you see the same thing, verse 8 in the NWT. God is your throne, and others would take it as evocative. Thy throne, O God, right? I read them already, the King James and I have just examples. Most translations, really. 
Although I don't think that's correct. It certainly doesn't appear obvious. And I've already discussed why, in part. And then it goes on to say, just like the Septuagint, scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of brightness. Now, there's a, dis, there's, a, there's a variant in this part of the text. Your kingdom. The earliest, and I would say best text, P46, Sinaiticus, and Vaticanus, say his kingdom. You hear in Hebrews 1.8. It, they, it changes the, the quotation, you could say. And I believe it, the writer of Hebrews does so intentionally, like I point out in my second edition of Jehovah's Witnesses Defended, when I talk about Hebrews 1.8, in response partially to Murray J. Harris. I talk about how it shows the writer of Hebrews is taking Hathias as a nominative. right? Because there's no real reason... To change your kingdom, the Septuagint translation of Hebrews 45, Psalm 45, 6. There's no reason not to use that pronoun if you saw Hathias as evocative. If you're already saying, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. But yet, let me point this out, the, the significance of the variant uh, versus that is the variant between your kingdom and his kingdom in the second part of verse 8. It's from Met Metzger, second edition of his textual commentary on the New Testament. Starting on page 592, although the reading out to of him or his kingdom, which has early and good support, P46, Sinaiticus B, may seem to be preferable, and I believe it, it is, because it differs from the re of the Old Testament passage that is being quoted, like I just mentioned, and because the earliest and <laughs> best texts use it, right? And it is changed from the quotation, which I believe is significant because it more likely shows Hathaos is viewed as a nominative by the writer of Hebrews. He goes on, to which on this point, presumably the mass of New Testament witnesses have been assimilated. Um... I'm talking about the change from out to, uh, from suit out to him versus you. A majority of the committee was more impressed, more impressed than the early support for out to. A, by the weight and verity of the external evidence supporting Sue or you, and B, by the internal difficulty of construing out to. But there's really not a difficulty if you just accept the text, right? Either way, you could argue there's some difficulty if you if you saw the initial part, as I mentioned, that was evocative. You're kind of in a conflict there because you, you, you're, you're breaking away not only from the sense of the text in terms of the direct address, but that's not even the quotation. So it's pretty significant. But they were more impressed by, A, as I mentioned, the external evidence supporting two and the internal difficulty of construing out two. Thus, if one reads out two, the words hot they us must be taken not as vocative, O God, an interpretation preferred by most exegetes, Trinitarians, most of them, but as the subject or predicate, as I mentioned, an interpretation that is generally regarded as highly improbable. I don't see it as improbable at all. In fact, I see it as just the opposite because, again, there's no reason to see it as vocative in light of, for example, Psalm 45, 1, Septuagint. It's the same basic use of Hathaos, it seems to me. There's nothing that calls out for it to be evocative, O God. And then you have the writer of Hebrews changing Su to Altu when Su would be much easier to sustain a reference and an understanding of, of Hathaos evocative. And that's why he says, if one reads Altu, the words Hathaos must be taken I don't know that that's necessarily correct, but I don't believe it's it's true at all, as I mentioned, that we have to take Hathias as vocative even if both readings are sued, right? Your throne, your kingdom. I, that doesn't require Hathias as vocative. God is your throne, your kingdom, right? The scepter of your kingdom. God is your throne and the scepter of your kingdom. Right? I could be talking to someone and say, hey, God is the source of your, th your authority. Right? God is your throne and the scepter of your kingdom. That's evocative. 
right? You, but it's it not in the first sense, right? Because you're not using Theos as evocative, but you're still describing the person, is what I'm saying. You're still speaking about them, but you're not speaking about God as, as, as the object of direct address by saying God is your throne. You're still describing the king, right? Still talking about the king. So again, uh, it, it, clear, it seems to me that the change from the original reading, it's not something nefarious. It's, it was done, I believe, by the author of Hebrews to show clearly he's not used, he, it made more sense for the writer of Hebrews to use it in that way, in the way he's applying these texts. So, and he also uses a couple other terms like and that aren't specifically, but that's again a part of the way he's using these texts. So, I think that's significant. He goes on just to complete this point here. Even if one assumes that Kai, which is absent from the Hebrew and the Septuagint of the Psalm, as I mentioned, was inserted by the author with this, the set purpose of making two quotations with verse 8a in the second person and 8b in the third person, the strangeness, the strangeness of the shift in persons is only slightly reduced. So again, it's a question of how strange you see the change from your throne, O God, or God is your throne, to his kingdom. It does seem strange, right? God is your throne forever and ever and the scepter of his kingdom. It could make sense that way. But if, O God, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever and the scepter of his kingdom... Right? That would require a separation between the one you're directly addressing. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of his kingdom, you see what I'm saying? There's no way you can connect out what is said in regards to out to his kingdom with the direct address, if that's how you see Hathaos in the first part. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of his kingdom See what I'm saying? That doesn't fit. And it's a change from the original text, at least according to the text we have, of the Septuagint of Psalm 44 being quoted in verse 8. So I definitely see the earliest texts of P46, Sinaiticus, and Vaticanus, and the reading about two as a clear indication that Hathaos in the first part of verse 8 is not evocative. And I don't believe it's evocative, even if we accept the reading Sue, preferred by Metzger and the UBS committee, in spite of the textual evidence of P46 and the other texts I mentioned. Because it's very similar, as I, as I also discussed, the way Hathaos is used in the nominative sense in Psalm 45.1. So why are we, why are we even thinking of evocative, really? To me, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make sense, doesn't fit, and it's, it's certainly not the best, the preferable, like they say it is. Certainly that's the impression you get when you just look at the English translations. But I don't see what why they should be considered the weight of evidence, right? They're just opinions by people who haven't discussed it the way we are. Or if they have, we've already reviewed and talked about most of what they've had to say. And so... There's no compelling reason that they have given that says this has to be, oh God. And that's what I would say to people if you wanted to just kind of make it quick and easy in terms of a discussion, right? Not get into the whole vocative and nominative. That's not easy to do. And you could also even point out that there are uses of God in the vocative. The E, theta, epsilon, epsilon. But that's mostly in Ezekiel. I think there's one reference in the Book of Kings, in the Septuagint. So you could argue, if I was going to you know, look at it completely, that the Septuagint translator of Psalms just didn't use the E, or the vocative, explicit vocative form of theos. And, and it is possible that theos is used, hot theos, as a vocative. It's just not, does not seem to me, upon reviewing the evidence, including reading the text, the quotations of the text in Hebrews 1.8, and the way that they're written in light of the way that other texts in the surrounding context are written, that that's the preferred translation, evocative. But that is not inconsistent with Sons of God theology. We've already discussed in this series of videos and in other videos and in 
writings I've done and in debates I've done. That the sons of God are gods. It's the very argument Jesus himself makes in John 10 when his religious opponents accuse him of blaspheming for claiming to be a god. And he argues that their own texts called those whom God condemns gods. So if they can be gods, he uses, uses a text that calls them gods in the plural. How much more so can he be a god? Because he's a son of God whom God sent. right? And that god whom God sent, who was with God in the beginning, that we'll get to in one of our future videos, John 1, all the texts. That God in Isaiah 9, 6, which we've talked about in my CW Jot Talk series, is called Mighty God. Let's go to that text. So if I were going to view Hebrews 1, 8 as evocative, and then we'll come back to Hebrews 1 and look at a few other texts and wrap this up. If I was going to look at Hebrews 1, 8 as evocative in light of the Bible, right? Well, we have a basis for doing that. And one of the basis for that is Isaiah 9, 6. It's not just a text that calls him God or mighty God, like you would be doing if you called him God in Hebrews 1, 8 as evocative, O God, which I don't believe is the likely translation, but that's acceptable in our view as long as you understand the biblical descriptions and the way they describe Jesus and others as gods, the way he argues, like I mentioned in John 10, that the sons of God are gods. They either represent the true God or they do not. And here it speaks about the Messiah and him as a, as a mighty God and more. Isaiah 9, 5 and 6. Well, we'll read 6 and 7. There has been a child born to us, a son given to us, and the princely rule will come to be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called. Right? We've talked about this text again in my CW Jaw Talk series, so I'm not going to go into it in detail, but I did there. So I encourage you to watch it. And it goes on to call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father. The Septuagint calls him Angel of Great Counsel. So Septuagint text used for centuries by the early Christians. This text isn't quoted in the New Testament text, so you know, that's why I refer to it in that way. But then it goes on to say, to the abundance of his princely rule, right? It says the child's born and the princely rule will come to be on his shoulder. His name will be called. To the abundance of the princely rule and the peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, in order to firmly establish and to sustain it by means of justice, by means of righteousness, from now on into time indefinite, the very zeal of Jehovah of armies will do this. He's the one. The glory to the Father. That's why. It's all because of Jehovah. Even if there's a son born who eventually becomes called God or a God. Just like the angel who ascended in the flame in Judges 13 that Manoah said was a God or God. But what he saw, what he described was God or a God in the same way that it's acceptable to call the sons of God who represent God, God. Just like we read in the accounts involving Exodus and Deuteronomy and the one I mentioned just now in Judges where the angel of Jehovah and angels like in Acts 7 say are the ones who speak as God if they're doing what he says. Public service, right? Hebrews 1, 7, quoting Psalm 104, 4. The angel of Jehovah is a part of that, right? Whom we believe, even Trinitarians, to be the pre-existent Son of God. But nevertheless, that's because of the role and position they were in then. None of them were raised to life as king. Not, not Michael, none of them. Even if Michael could be differentiated as the archangel, right? He's still involved with public service doing things like in Daniel. And he's not raised to the position of king or even the right hand. That happens after Jesus gives his life. Just like here, it says the child's born and is comes to be called. All related to the princely rule, right? To the kingdom, the kingship that would not end. What does Hebrews 1, 8 say? About the king, kingship and the throne. You do it right here. It says, God is your throne or thy throne, O God. 
forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom or his kingdom, the reading out two in the earliest mass tax, is the scepter of uprightness. This is all related and applied from the messianic text of Psalm 44, 45, Greek, Hebrew, that specifically applies it to the Davidic king, just like here, about the throne that they would be given forever. Okay, so is it God is your throne or thy throne, O God? Well, as I said, I believe the weight of evidence is that the God, Hatheos, is a nominative in either a subject or predicate in this text. With it being a subject, God is your throne, meaning God is the source of the authority being given here, as it describes, right? Him receiving the name above uh, every name in Philippians 2, and then here the name better than the angels, right hand of the majesty in lofty places. God is your throne forever and ever, quoting from Psalm 44, 45, about the Davidic kingship that would not end. Right? So, okay, even though I believe it's more likely God is your throne, what does that mean? And we'll get back to the whole implication of the vocative, but as I explained, even the Messiah who is given this kingship is called Mighty God. So it would be okay to call him thy throne, O God, right? He's already called Mighty God. The angel in Judges 13 is called God. They speak as God, as Jehovah. So it doesn't make any difference. You're always addressing God through these beings. The Son, more than any of them. That's why he starts out by pointing out that the Son is the main one. Firstborn, exact image, expression of his glory, the one through whom he made the ages. This is the one who would be doing that and who did, right, all the way to death as a man. Same thing Paul talks about in Philippians 2. Right here, Hebrews 1. That's how he became better. He comes back into the earth as the firstborn. With reference to the angels in the past who were made spirits, like we read in the accounts from Exodus to Judges. Here they're quoting Psalm 104.4, where it refers back to those types of accounts with the angels in that way. In a public service, not in the temple of heaven, that the high priest Jesus is later raised to, Hebrews 8, but, and 12, like we read earlier, but before that arrangement took effect, when they were serving God without being raised to his right hand as the one on his throne. So it wouldn't make any difference whether he was addressed as God here. They're already addressed as God when they're not even on the throne. So, and in prophecy in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, he's called mighty God. Not mighty person of God. We believe he's a mighty God. We believe he's a God who was with the God. John 1, 1. We're going to get to it more soon. But we're going to finish up with Hebrews 1 and a little bit of 2. And so here, let's find out a little bit more about what, what is this throne. If God is his throne, and it's not... Thy throne, O God, okay. Well, this is what it's talking about. We already read in Isaiah 9, right, how he's the mighty God who fulfills the Davidic prophecy about the kingship that would never end, that would come to be upon his shoulders due to the zeal of Jehovah. So then it goes on to describe in Revelation that when all these things take place, we talked about a few texts that speak of things that take place, like the Son of Man arriving on his throne, when that occurs, and the significance of it. But here in terms of the throne and the significance of it in Hebrews 1.8 and why it would make sense to say God is your throne, understanding that to be essentially, you know, God is the one who is the source of your throne because of texts like this that further explain it. If we didn't have anything that made sense, it still would fit because it makes sense in the historical context in which it's applied to the Davidic king in Psalm 44, 45. So if we take it as a nominative, God is your throne, and we have texts like this in Revelation 3, where Jesus says to the one that conquers, I will grant to sit down with me on my throne. Even as I conquered, just like I did, I'm going to do to you. 
because I conquered and I sat down with my father on his throne. That's what we're talking about. This is what, what I would mean in a more explicit and descriptive sense with the way that the texts are applied to Jesus and in light, of course, of everything that is said historically in that context to the Davidic king, to what is said about the Messiah and prophecy in Isaiah 9, 6. And then here, when that one directly is said to have spoken about what that means. It means... He's being given the same authority as Jehovah, but it's being given to him just like Hebrews 1, the name that he has given, inherited a name, Psalm, uh, Philippians 2, right? He's given a position above all others to the glory of God the Father. It's the same thing. It's always from the Father. The Father is his throne. God is your throne. Just like in Psalm 44, 45, God was the one responsible for the throne of the Davidic king. But even if we take it as evocative, might it mean hateos, using Hebrews 1.8, it's still completely consistent with the way Jesus is presented as God and or as a God or a mighty God. All the descriptions would be applicable to him in the sense that he represents him, the God, the one whom the very next part of our subject text describes as his God. Right? Not something that we want to read here. It's everywhere. John 20. Right? Revelation 3. Other texts. And the opening of letters in the New Testament. Our, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, here in verse 9, the last text in our subject reading for this video, you loved righteousness. It's going on to quote, the rest of the application made in Psalm 44, 45, Greek Hebrew text. You loved righteousness and you hated lawlessness. That is why God, your God, not you are God, but why your God, the God of you, we'll talk about it more in a moment, anointed you with oil of exaltation more <clears throat> excuse me than your partners right here it explicitly states that Jesus has a God even if you take verse 8 in the vocative from the application in Psalm 44 45 same thing but in the greater sense in which it applies to Jesus at the right hand of God the whole context leading up to this it's in the context of him having a God. It's very similar to John 20, is it not? Right? In John 20, 28, Thomas addresses Jesus as my Lord and my God in the same sense that angels, like we read about earlier, are addressed as Jehovah or called God, the voice of God called out of the bush. It, it, it's God we've seen. They're directly addressed as Jehovah. He speaks to them as I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all these things. So in the same way, the resurrected Jesus Establishing who he is to Thomas is called that. But then, but in verse 17, just previously, he had explicitly stated he was ascending to his God and their God. And so the only God he could be is that God. The Father. My Father and your Father. John 20, 17. Right here. Hebrews 1, 9, same thing. So if we take a look, uh, the Greek text, God, the God of you. It's not, it clearly here does not appear to be evocative in any sense. That is why God, your God, you know, the God of you, anointed you for the reasons just stated that he's been building up after describing him having made a purification since verse 3. And after staying prior to that, that he speaks to us by means of a son. We discussed it earlier, leading up to our reading. So here in Hebrews 1.9, now in the Hebrew text, it is also explicit. It makes it plain. It says, Elohim Elohek. 
and which has the construct form second person singular form of Elohim God God of you it is undeniable that the one being talked about here all the way through in whatever condition you say this is applied to him in the very same application from the very same texts Psalm 44 45 Greek or Hebrew it says there's someone who is this being's God the the being whom they say in evocative sense is addressed as a God or as God that would also then be true of course of the Davidic King in Psalm 44 45 has a God which we also already know is true right we, we know that the angels as gods have a God this isn't really something new it's just kind of new in relation to this text because the way they use it right when they're using it thy throne O God he's called God so you can't even it's hard to just get through to verse 9 right and say look you know I appreciate your time but he's called he's said to have a God over him right here from the original source material and in the application so we believe it's not only more correct to translate the actual words used hapeos as a nominative based on the way that it's used in the Septuagint and the surrounding context of Psalm 44 which which is where Psalm 45 in the Hebrew corresponds with but the variant reading for your kingdom which is his kingdom in the earliest and best texts P46 Sinaiticus Vaticanus shows that the author of Hebrews was clearly taking Hatheos here as a nominative subject or predicate but even if you take it as evocative thy throne your throne O God it not only applies to the Davidic king in Psalm 44 45 and therefore must be qualified in the same way that other applications of God are qualified whether it's figures like Moses the Davidic King in Psalm 45 44 45 the Messiah Psalm 9 the sons of God numerous texts Genesis 6 Job 1 2 numerous texts in the Psalms Deuteronomy 32 Psalm 97 John 10 Psalm 82 this is not new as I mentioned any of these kings whether it's Psalm 44 45 or any of the angels who are referred to as God are only and ever called that because of the one who puts them in the position where they're called that right even the son is that not obvious right here he has become better how the extent he inherited a name he sat down at the right hand of majesty became better got a new name Philippians 2 same thing to the glory of whom father the one who brings his firstborn into the earth who makes his angel spirits flames of fire like in the past but with the son he enthrones him forever the son sits on the father's throne according to the son Revelation 3 which shred it and then lets those approved sit with him not on his throne but on his father's throne so that's a third person reference here it says God is your throne if it's a nominative just like Jesus says in Revelation 3 my father on his throne that fits better with God is your throne right because God is the one who is the source of the one who is said to be the the one whom God is the throne right the source of whatever it is this person has is God God is the one who is going to keep you in throne forever and ever same as Psalm 44 45 it means the same thing only in the greater sense in which the son inherits a better name okay so that 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 never changes none of these things change from here that point where after he made a purification 
and then all these things either took place or will take place in terms of him coming into the earth and the fulfillment of that text like we talked about in our prior videos and then the distinction between us the angels including perhaps even according to trinitarians right the son is the angel of Yahweh, serving as public servants in the past but with the son now since his resurrection right hand of god being enthroned by god as god being his throne forever sitting on his father's throne and he is the one the one who enthroned the son who is the god of the son